Hello, people. <laughs> so, psychology of code readability. Why? I think there's, in software engineering, there's so much rules of thumb and like arcane knowledge to like do something. If you build this shrine, you get these features for your code. However, software engineering kind of implies that you can actually derive and figure out what the properties should be based on the axioms of software engineering in general. And for code readability, of course, we are all humans, mostly. A uh, few of you consider yourself gophers, maybe? Okay, I don't know about gopher psychology. But let's take a simple example. If I ask you to remember these two words, you will be really struggling. And at the end of the conference, you probably wouldn't remember those. Our brains have limitations, it's obvious. Um, but also, it's interesting to see that when we shuffle those letters, it's going to be much easier. You're going to remember those words whether I ask you to or not. So we also have these magnificent capabilities. And if we use those cap capabilities better, we can make our code better as well. And of course, psychology is the foundation for our brain working, essentially. We are going to cover these three topics fast and shallowly. If you are an expert, you probably think the examples are simple, but you can always imagine that you're studying Kango 4 design patterns or microarchitectures or whatever, instead of my slides. <laughs> okay, let's get started. First, the simple thing, long-term memory, or like how we um, can use that knowledge. Let's take a humble for loop. How many would think that A is better than all the rest of that? I guess everybody? Yeah. Uh, who would fire the person who wrote D? <laughs> uh, as I suspected. But why? Why is that so much better? Like, we, they are, Intrinsically, they're kind of similar. They express the same idea, but somehow A feels better. And there's this concept of familiarity and unfamiliarity and pattern recognition in our brains. So let's take the, when you're first learning to code, how you're going to look at this code you're going to see that, oh, there's a four. You remember that, oh yeah, I, there was a class about it, it was on slide seven, I think, it was about repetition, so yeah. Then we initialize i to zero, then we look at the last thing there, yeah, let's add one. Uh, and then you think, oh, i is less than n, does it mean that it's plus one when it ends, or minus one? But you're kind of debating this whole process in your head with unfamiliar code. Let's say you've now written this line 3,000 times and have three years of experience, and, and the process for that looks like this. You're going to instantly recognize it as something important, and you're going to ignore a lot of the code, actually. So when we take these two things, it's mostly about familiarity, not uh, actual what it's saying, um, mostly. Uh, and if we do take this last line and put it in front of an expert who has been writing code for 10 years, he would do this whole process again, because it's unfamiliar. And of course, now you're kind of thinking, oh yeah, I've, I think I know what it's all about. Of course, 
consistency, consistency in all the things, and being naming variables the same way, like formatting your code the same way, structuring your code similarly in different packages, or in declaring the interaction between different uh, services in a similar way. And we have in Go community, there's a really nice name for it, idiomatic Go code. Like, go look up a tutorial and you see the, all the things we do automatically and we have gotten used to it, so the long-term memory. It is our common vocabulary to speak Go. Um, of course, it's important to notice that it doesn't mean idiomatic code is good or bad. It's just common. So here's the but. Um, sometimes it might be better to ignore the idioms. I'm not saying that it's this example. It might be some other. But as we see here, we have this DSL dot everywhere. It's littered everywhere. If, but the recommendation is not to use dot imports. Like, they lose some information and it makes the code difficult to read. But when we do it, that this code becomes less noisy because we didn't need this to ignore this DSL dot on every line. So there's this inherent trade-off between using something everybody knows or something familiar for people or creating something new. Um, it might be some using higher order abstractions or creating one of those, um, creating a new router package, uh, even if you don't get maybe too much benefit from it. Of course, this is one of those long-term memory things because this is stored in a long-term memory, this familiarity. And the next thing, which is going to get more interesting, I promise. Um, relying on idiomatic code isn't always uh, sufficient because we need to write new code, not code that everybody else has written. Um, and we cannot force people to learn every idiom that we come up with or the common code. So how can we structure our code better such that everybody can learn it more easily? So how much did you remember? Like, um, probably not much. There's proper research on it, like how much we can remember in our working memory. Miller's research initially was about like this seven plus minus two uh, magical number seven. You maybe heard of it. Recent more studies have like downgraded it to four. I'm not sure because people are getting stupider or it's just, well, actually it's the other thing, but. And there are a few other theories about decaying working memory instead of having a fixed limit and so on. But for all intents and purposes, we can assume that this four plus minus one is this uh, like really nice number. Of course, you might be thinking that you remembered more. There's this thing that our brain does. It automatically tries to recognize groups. Um, so when we take this sequence of numbers, some might already recognize these as separate things, and if we lay it out this way, we immediately recognize it as a date. So our brain automatically creates these chunks that help us store this information in our long-term memory and keep it in our working memory. And of course, we kind of attach more information and it layers upwards uh, and kind of we build this like this tree of knowledge or graph of knowledge in our brains as these chunks. And why does it matter? 
why do chunks matter? Since chunks are the way that our brains organize things, it helps to deliver this information such that we can perceive these chunks immediately in our code. Because creating these chunks from scratch without any recognition would be difficult. Uh, so uh, let's say we have these like few lines of variables and Already here, because we are grouping them together, our brain immediately re recognizes them as a single chunk and uh, to be and important uh, as a collection. Of course, when we give them a better name, we can recall it from our long-term mem memory much easier. So when we see the buffer in our rest of the code, it's kind of immediately that, oh yeah, that was that thing that contained these other chunks of information. Of course, we can also group many different ways. It's not just types. You can for use, for example, white space. White space is a really good example of grouping this information such that our brain doesn't need to find the separation between different ideas and chunks, so we can create this network much easier. And of course, package names are names like this recalling mechanisms for our chunks in our long-term memory. So you can immediately, like looking at bytes, you know that this means that the next thing that comes after it, it's about bytes. Um, it's kind of obvious, but they are recalling mechanisms. So that's why the dot imports aren't recommended, because they break this ability to rec recall things from our long-term memory. Of course, we could like write this package out multiple ways to use this recalling mechanism. Uh, we could use like strings, or we could use S as a package name, or we could use uh, something a Java developer would do, <laughs> or, um, or we could just use index of, like without any qualifier. For very common things, it's useful to use this really short names. So if you use this S dot, it must be really important in your code. Otherwise, it's going to confuse everybody like what you're doing. It's something that everybody must know. So in Go compiler code, you have the M, P, and G structures that everybody knows who reads compiler code. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's right. Um, or sometimes it might be too noisy uh, using this package name altogether, so you might use the dot import path and... And, yeah. And you're kind of thinking maybe that I'm smart, I can handle more than four chunks. Definitely. <laughs> um, not really, though. Uh, well, you can handle more chunks, but not in your working memory. So let's take a look at the gopher inside. Um, well, this is distracting. Well, you need to use that one. So this is our, let's say this is our long-term memory. How we construct this, uh, like a visual representation of it. Each of these are a chunk and how they are associated with other things. And when we always do something, we have this focus of attention. Some things might call it locus of attention. It's the same thing, uh, mostly, yeah. Um, this is what it's, is in our working memory. So when we are looking around in our code, this, move, this focus of attention moves around. Of course, it isn't free, this moving our activation or neural activation in our brain. So we kind of, there's always this cost associated with it. And we might kind of go up abstractions or 
lower abstractions. So like move between different levels of chunks. And this is like we are multitasking all the time when we are moving our attention. If you don't believe me that you really do, there's a cost associated with it. Number all your code lines and shuffle them and try to understand it. You still have the numbers so you know exactly where it is in the code, but you probably won't be able to understand it easily because jumping from line to line has a really huge cost in those situations because you cannot perceive those chunks anymore. And of course, this usually happens eventually. Um, so there's this inherent two things that code readability is about. One is trying to be under our working memory capacity so we can fit things into our head, actually. And on the same time, we are trying to minimize moving our focus of attention. What it means is that to fit in everything our, in our working memory, we need to reduce the number of interacting pieces in a single lo point or locus in our code base. On the other hand, to not move our focus of attention, we need to preserve everything in, in the same locus or in the same place in our code. So we have these two opposing forces fighting with each other and trying to find the right balance. One gives us spaghetti code if we just ignore our working memory capacity. We just put everything together and it's going to be a mess. It's hard to pick out the chunks and we cannot perceive it. On the other hand, we create too many abstractions, which themselves also increase the cognitive load because we are now moving across packages and files. What we want is this balance. And we really want it. Um, this notion of 4 plus minus 1 actually, when you look at code, you start to notice it everywhere. It's interesting. So when you look at the packages, you kind of notice that they tend to have four methods. Every struct, for example. Or the critical information is usually re represented as, uh, or interacting things are represented as four structs. But it's not that easy, because we cannot just count methods. Our brains are really good at ignoring things as well. We usually don't look at what new does, what close does. We also ignore a lot of um, different uh, characters that don't have matter, um, that don't really matter to, for understanding the code. And of course, utility functions. Usually, people just assume they work and kind of stuff it somewhere else. So we also usually don't carry those around in our working memory either. And it also applies in multiple levels, for example, in files. But as you see, I put some of those on a single line. This is because our brains are really good at grouping things. We don't perceive these files as kind of totally different things. We kind of see them related because of this something common they have. Um, in the first case, it's just a stat underscore. In the other one is this read prefix. So when we are kind of using this type, we are typing read and then kind of trying to figure out like what we actually want to read. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's like four plus minus one for the groups, but just counting them is hard because our brains do funny things. <laughs> of course, uh, some problems are hopeless. 
Um, if you're working at distributed systems or highly tuning your some code, then you're not going to fit it in your working memory. It's going to be a mess anyways. So you need to take this into account. So probably use fuzzers, formal methods to start validating them. Your brain cannot handle them. Um, and the final part, how do we actually solve problems? Because code readability isn't just about writing readable code, we actually need to maintain it. So we often conflate them, so it's appropriate. How do we solve problems? We have this mental representation what the problem is. So this is our kind of mental model. Then we kind of simulate it in our head a little bit, like trying to figure out like, oh, I need to do that, and it will work, hopefully. Uh, as we know, it doesn't, but, um, but how does code fit into here? So there's this translation layer, kind of, where we are like seeing the code and pulling this code up into our working memory and kind of building out this mental model. And eventually, once we modify the mental model, we try to modify the code as a result. And there are many things that can go wrong here. Let's take assembly. Uh, if you don't know assembly, that's fine. Um, I, I'll say this, assembly is a really, really simple language. It is, it really is. But there's this problem with it. It, it, it doesn't match our mental model. So the first step we do is usually we translate into our, like regular code. Unless you're doing assembly for a long time, then like this, this gets uh, erased. But. And then we build out this mental model that we can actually work with from this code. So we are kind of doing these extra steps to figure out how to modify this code. And this goes both ways, like um, fixing one way and the other way. And it's better if it, these two match, because then there's less cognitive load. We don't have to create this mental model. Or we have to do less work to use it. But it goes the other way as well. If you're doing really low-level things, then your mental model is assembly or machine code. And it's going to be much harder to do it in a higher level language than in assembly directly, because now you're taking this regular code, translating it into assembly in your head, and then thinking about machine code and how the CPU internally works. Of course, you can also have a poor mental model. Like when you try to do math with Roman numerals, you're going to have a really bad time. Um, And there are many methods you've heard about. It's like domain modeling, TDD, uh, yeah, many others as well. But uh, even if you have this perfect mental model, there might be problems. So here's something people don't recommend doing: is uh, we have some code, then we have SQL code, and then we have uh, some regular code again. But why, why it's problematic? It's because these two concepts of how Go code works and SQL code works is quite different how we think about it. So we get this same multitasking between those two thinking patterns or thinking ways of thinking. Um, So we need a proper mental model to go along with uh, your code. And there are different paradigms that help you design different mental models. And I think Go is here one of those languages that really help to create nice mental models because they hide a lot of tools that you can shoot into your foot. Um, 
Of course, this means that some problems cannot be nicely expressed with Go, uh, unfortunately. So, oh well, uh, we take what we can. Uh, and I really love this quote about um, perspectives in general, because when you create this nice mental model, it means that it's much simpler to write code in general. So if you go from Roman numerals to Arabic numbers, then it's going to be so much nicer. We got through this. I know it's lots of information for people, if you never have heard of it. But yeah. So we need to think about how we perceive code and how we process and do our daily lives because it helps us understand better how we how to write code and why something is bad rather than saying that this person on the shrine said so. To recap, consistency, consistency everywhere. Um, you can think of like, can I make it more consistent in your code base? Um, or what if, what if I broke the idiomatic way? Uh, I don't recommend it. People will hate you for it. You will be exercised from venues. <laughs> Not real, but um, it's, you need to do this wisely. Then finding this right balance between putting things in your working memory and breaking them apart. And like, how much interfaces do you really need? Or can you remove them and reduce this uh, breadth or this wider area where your code is located? Or try different mental models. Use different languages to write your code. You will learn so much in the process and you will eventually write better Go code as well. And if all else fails, then get down to it and analyze properly what's happening in your brain. Um, it's quite interesting to see these small examples but it's much, much more interesting when you start to dissect solid principles or gang of war design patterns or anything more complex when they, these all ideas start to conflict and interact. So I want to thank uh, people that have helped me uh, organize my thoughts like Tavi, Helena, Bill, and much, much more people, Jonathan, and so, and thank you for listening, and I hope this helps you in your daily lives. Thank you.